Okay, whenever you guys go and sit for the ARRT examination, they're going to have 33 questions for you that deal with patient care. Now, they basically just want to get a feel for how well you've learned the material. If you've studied and you've read the books a little bit, listened up in class, and hopefully gotten some of this stuff reinforced in clinic, then you're not going to have a problem. Anybody that doesn't know what they're talking about, you know, they're, they're going to get weeded out by this examination. Now, there's several different sections of patient care. Ethical and legal, you know, we've talked about all that uh, respondeat superior stuff. <coughs> Interpersonal communications, you know, they're going to have some questions about how you deal with people, you know, on that level. Physical assistance, how do you get somebody on and off a wheelchair to the table? back to the stretcher without dumping them in the floor. Um, medical emergencies, what if all of a sudden somebody has a grand mal seizure right in the middle of a knee x-ray? Well, that could never happen. Uh, yes, it has, to moi. You know, and it's scary, you know, when that kind of stuff happens. Infection control, ah, choo! Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, okay, we want to wash our hands and we want to make sure that we don't poison our patients with germs while they're in our care. And hazmat, you know, when was the last time we had a serious chemical spill in the radiology department? Well, yeah, knock on wood, never. Still, in every department there are MSDS, okay, and we're supposed to know where those are. We don't necessarily have to read them and memorize them. But we do have to be aware that there are hazmat procedures in place and what to do. And ARRT wants to make sure that we do. And pharmacology, you know, we're all out there with drugs in hand. So the ARRT wants to know that we are responsible and that we know the correct procedures behind administering medications. Don't forget about this thing, the patient's rights. The patient's rights. They have the right to confidentiality per HIPAA. You guys all familiar with HIPAA, I hope. Um, the AHA, the American Hospital Association, lists out the patient's rights, and here they are. <coughs> right to privacy. We're not supposed to be blabbing about our patients, you know, outside of the healthcare environment. The extent of care. How far do we take things? Some patients have a living will. Some people have a do not resuscitate order. So that's the kind of thing that needs to be brought to the physician's attention when they come in, like on a code blue, and you happen to be there, and you have access to the patient's chart. Um, access to information. OK, am I allowed to go in and check on Mr. Ron's condition? Because I know he's in the hospital. You know, Can I pull up Epic and, and look up his information? He's my buddy. I know him, right? Yeah. Exactly. It doesn't matter if it's your mom or your dad or, you know, somebody you met 12 years ago. You cannot just look up patient information without a legitimate reason. You can totally open their chart if they're in the department and you're working on them right this minute because that's information that is important and you need to know it. wonder if they have some allergies we should know about. Um, research participation. Not all hospitals. Some hospitals are teaching facilities. New Hanover Regional happens to be one of them. There are certain people at the hospital, patients, that are involved in research projects. And it can be stuff like uh, knee replacement surgery. You know, maybe they're trying out a new appliance. Here's some legal issues for you. We're supposed to make sure that the patient we've got for an x-ray really is who we think they are. Has anybody ever brought a patient into the room for an x-ray and only then realized that you had the wrong guy? Yeah? Some people yes, some people no. Yes. Okay, before you pull the trigger on that x-ray machine, you want to make sure you check that patient's wristband. Because a lot of people, you go to them in the ED and you say, hey, um, are you Mr. Jones? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm Jones. No, they're not. They're Mr. McIntyre. You know, they, they're just confused. They don't know where they are. Um, so it's up to us to make sure that this guy really is, you know, the, the correct person. Restraints and immobilization. Do you guys know the difference between those? Yes. Restraints have to be ordered. Correct. You cannot put somebody in cuffs without a doctor's order. 
Okay, that's called false imprisonment. False imprisonment. Very good. Um, what about immobilization techniques? Yes, okay, immobilization techniques are simply to help the patient hold still for this particular image. They're not to strap them down to the table for an extended period of time. Okay, so we can't bind the guy down with a sheet to where he can't get up. But we can tape his fingers back, you know, for a finger x-ray to, to help keep him in position. Um, digital images. This is something that's relatively new over the last few years. The ARRT wants you to understand about the exposure indicators, how they work. Some places have a S number, you know, they're using the Fuji equipment. Some places are using the new quote unquote standard AAPM exposure indicator. But either way, we want you to, to be able to tell, was this image overexposed, underexposed, or was it relatively accurately exposed? We're supposed to be using the correct histogram. No fair running an elbow under a hand. Okay, so if you're shooting an elbow x-ray, make sure that you're using the elbow histogram. Window width and level. We all know how to manipulate the window width and level. This is important. Always reset that before you send it to PAX, and everybody's cool with why that is. True? Okay, masking and cropping. Good golly, I was at a clinic just the other day, and I saw somebody doing this, and I was like, okay, I thought <coughs> that I had conquered this golem once and for all, you know, and that the masking and cropping of anatomy was dead, never to return. Darn if it hasn't reared its ugly head again understand the temptation. You know, everybody wants to be like the textbook radiographer that comes down exactly to the joint space. With masking and cropping, we can make it look that way. That's not ethical. Anything that got exposed to the x-rays needs to be brought to the doctor's attention. Yes, ma'am? I think that's also an educational problem because seasoned techs recently discovered that the doctor has to read the entirety of the image and mm -hmm. cut it out as a problem. And they're like, I didn't know that. About well, cropping, it wasn't... Like, how would not... you know if somebody never told you? What gets to me, though, are the people that came through this program that have been here and they've heard everybody tell them how well, to do have, it. To do and then they go out and do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. And... You can do that. You know, I mean, it's your responsibility. I'm just saying, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Well, like, even how like, I resize the boxes, and I mean, it makes the picture prettier because it kind of mm -hmm. it down, but the radiologist can still see all the anatomy. It just, like, if he, if he can open it, they can open it back up so that they can resize it to, like, full regions. That's true. So, I mean, you can make it pretty without actually cropping it. So, I mean, I don't really think that. I understand the why, I understand the temptation, you know, I mean, I'm tempted to do a lot of stuff. I'm tempted to drink whiskey and smoke, you know, uh, but I don't necessarily do that because, you know, there's reasons not to. A little word from the ARRT, the radiologic technologist respects confidences entrusted in the course of professional practice respects the patient's right to privacy, and reveals confidential information only as required by law or to protect the welfare of the individual or the community. This is relatively new stuff. Um, so keep this in mind. You know, as an ARRT member, we're ethically bound to protect these patients to the best of our ability. Now, Suppose a radiographer does disclose confidential patient information to unauthorized individuals, and so you might be found guilty of, and ooh, my animation messed up. It's not supposed to give away the answer until I push the button. <laughs> but that's what it is, invasion of privacy. I have a quick question. So you, I'm sure you've heard about the nurse who wouldn't give the cop the blood work. Or yeah, or that nurse was totally in the right. Right. And so that, the policeman have... was on a total power trip. Okay. 
He would have to have like a warrant or something against the man. Everything that policeman did was illegal. Okay. He was breaking the law just as much as if he was smashing out the windows of a jewelry store. I didn't hear about that. Wow. You I mean, it's hard to imagine an officer of the law with that little knowledge of the law carrying a gun. I mean, that scares me worse than an army of criminals. It really isn't. You know, there's reasons for that that I'll not discuss here. Okay, a little communication. How would you guys like to communicate with people? Communication important for us? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we have to communicate with one another and with the people that we're trying to take x-rays of. Now, this is sometimes challenging for various and sundry reasons. We've got to be able to speak clearly and communicate, bless you, communicate what we need. We also have to write it down. At the hospital, if something doesn't get written down, then it didn't happen. It never happened. It's just he said, she said. What about nonverbals? Okay, people that, they may not necessarily be saying something, but you can definitely pick up their mood. This is a terrible challenge for me because I'm an empath. If one person walks through that door in a crap mood, then it messes me up. Um, I, I can't not feel it, you know? Um, and, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to shake off. But in a patient care environment, very valuable because a lot of these patients are nonverbal. So you have to be able to pick up on their, you know, wincing or, you know, any kind of. It's hard to teach that, isn't it? It's the kind of thing you, you feel it more than you know it. Um, language barriers. Say habla espanol. Have you guys ever had patients that spoke no English? I mean, seriously, they didn't know how to say hello. Yeah. Well, how do you work with somebody like that? You got to tell them to hold their breath. No verbals. <laughs> si. <laughs> Profunda. That's your little iPad thing. Okay, great. Yes. Um, there are interpreters at the hospital available. Um, we're supposed to be using those guys because, okay, now I might be able to say respira profundo y no respira, y no mueve. I can say a few things like that. Can I read a consent form to somebody from Russia? No way. You know, I, I would just never be able to do it. I've got to have an interpreter. Um, cultural issues. Good God. Okay, there are so many machismo cultures that... They're alien to us Westerners. We don't understand how in the world people can be stuck still in the year of our Lord 600. But they are, and they have these uh, cultural taboos. You know, maybe men, I might not be allowed to touch a woman as far as her man is concerned. Um, then again, a female nurse may not be able to touch certain male patients. Uh, they just come completely unclued. Um, very difficult to deal with, and you know, we just, but we have to. You know, here we are in North Carolina, and we're like a magnet to people from all over the planet. You know, they want to be with us, and so here they come. Ready or not? Impaired patients. Some of your patients are semi conscious, unconscious, delirious, just plain drunk, um, delusional. We don't know if they can hear us or not sometimes. They're out. We talk to them anyway. Okay, that is, and you're probably going to see questions like that on the registry. You'll say, you know, here's the situation. you got an unconscious patient. What do you do? Well, you talk to them just like as if they were able to have a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, age. We've got little kids. we got middle-aged people. we got old geriatric people. Um, different ways of communicating with each of those groups. Who here is really good at dealing with babies? Uh, chances are, if you have babies of your own, or if you've got um, little brothers and sisters that you took care of when they were just babies, that is a huge help because, you know, you can just take care of another baby, you know, just kind of take it and strut it. Now, 
whenever I first started having kids of my own, I was clueless wonder. I had never changed a diaper before. I mean, come on, I was a hot shot, jet setting computer programmer from Washington, D.C. You know, I wasn't changing diapers, I was changing planes. <laughs> You know, and, and so having a, a family, it was a big learning experience, but I got really good at it. And emotional. Sometimes patients are, and it's tough to deal with, they're sick, they're dying. We know they're dying, but they don't know that. Or they know it on some level, but they have not yet admitted it to themselves. That's this business about have they come to accept their condition yet. We have to work around that because it's easy to, you know, kind of open your mouth and stick your foot in it around patients that are at end of life. You know, so just something to be on the lookout for. Now, gerontologic patients. A radiographer should recognize that gerontologic, what does that mean anyway? Old, Old exactly. They have undergone physical changes that include the loss of what? Oh, those. One, two. Oh, very astute. I can tell that you're going to do well. Yes, muscle mass, definitely. Bone calcium, a.k.a. osteoporosis. Yes, mental alertness is not a physical issue. It's a mental one. So you're exactly right. Mental state is not a physical change. Watch out for this kind of wording. Because if you're just like flying through a test and you look at this, you'd be tempted to say one, two, and three. Because those all go with being old. Moral communication. Hopefully you all are sharp on medical terminology. And you can explain to people in terms they can understand what's going on. And this is important here. Keep in mind, yours may be the first explanation that they've heard. So you need to be able to tell them, okay, here's the procedure we're going to be doing today. You're going to have a lumbar puncture. And when the doctor comes in, we're going to get you to lay face down on the table, and they're going to be inserting a needle into your back. It's probably going to be a little bit painful, but not bad. We're going to need informed consent. We've got to make sure that we get that. Um, pre and post exam instructions. Go ahead and load them up with this information. Tell them, okay, if they've been having a barium swallow, what are they going to be doing for the next few days? Drinking a ton of water, more so than they normally would. Because we don't want that barium to set up in their guts. That can give them like bad constipation. And other modalities. Wonder if this patient's getting ready to go to MRI next. And you don't necessarily have to be an MRI tech, okay? but to be able to kind of tell them what to expect once they get there so that they're not just like totally shocked every time they walk through a door. Because sometimes these patients show up at the hospital and they're clueless wonder. They don't know what in the hay is going on. Yes, ma'am? What's a good response when a patient asks, why am I having an x-ray when I'm going for an MRI after this? Because the doctor thinks that, or they suspect that you might have some metal in your body they want to just double check and make sure that there's not any. And if there is any metal, it'll show up on this x-ray. And that might tell them that you don't need an MRI. What if they say, we're going for a CT after this? We're going for a CT after this. And why am I getting an x-ray when I'm going for a CT? Because a CT, scan, a CT scan shows really, really good contrast. But the image detail is poor. So a lot of times the doctor needs like a high resolution x-ray image, which we can provide, to go along with the low resolution CT scan. There's just different information on those two and the doc needs to be able to see them side by side. And I don't know if Mariah's question is she was necessarily asking about metal because I've had a patient before like we're doing a knee x-ray yeah. and you're going to have an MRI yeah, like in the chest. Yeah, in the chest or something, so, so it was weird. Same you thing. You know what I mean? Okay, MR. Y'all know that cortical bone is invisible on an MRI, right? Right, right. that's what, would you go into yes. explaining that? Say, so the doctor probably, and we don't know for sure, because I know exactly mind reader. Wrong, so. I mean, I kind of know what the doctor might be, I know what I'd be looking for. Right. Okay, I want to have an x-ray that I can correspond to the MRI slices so that I've got the good spatial resolution on the one hand and the good contrast resolution on the other. 
that gives me the best of both worlds. It's almost like uh, fusion imaging. Does that make sense? Insurance. Don't think you have to have an x-ray before your insurance? That's a possibility, too. There has to be an imaging chain. Because if you, if you just, like, cut straight to the MRI, then that's liable to raise. I mean, the insurance company's probably going to pay eventually. But they're going to raise objections first. So if, if the steps have been followed correctly, then there shouldn't be any issue with reimbursements. Everybody knows not to dump the patient on the floor, I hope. <coughs> Don't forget your body mechanics. Okay? You're going to see questions like, you know, should you bend from the waist to pick up a heavy weight? Probably not, unless you're just looking to collect workers' comp. You should definitely bend from the knees, and always, when you're moving patients, this was one thing that I had to learn the hard way, um, when you're moving patients from the stretcher to the table or anywhere, make sure you've got your knees flexed during the motion. Um, and a wide base of support really helps too. Wide base of support helps, yes. Feet shoulder width apart and all that good stuff. Um, whenever we've got a wheelchair and we're rolling our wheelchair up to the table, that should approach the table at an angle of 45. about 45 degrees, yes. Um, medical equipment. Important in the department for sure, because sometimes we have patients that come in with IVs, so we have to transfer from the bed to an IV pole temporarily. We want to make sure we don't haul on those lines. A CV line can be pulled out. Uh, one of my co-workers at the hospital did it one time. Um, it was a bloody mess, so you don't want to go there. We've got pumps. Now, luckily, in the year of our Lord 2018, a lot of these pumps have gotten really, really small. Okay, they're not the big bruisers that they used to be. But still, we have to take care and make sure that they're plugged in, because they can only last for so long on battery power. This. If you don't know how these lines work and how these pumps work, ask a nurse. They will show you the basics. Now, they're probably not going to show you how to program a pump, but they can teach you stuff like how to, you know, maybe reset the alarm and, and odds and ends like that that will be important for you. Oxygen lines. Patient comes in with oxygen. You know, we typically take the line and move it from the canister over to the wall, and we move it back. Just make sure that the patient, if they're on oxygen, they stay on it at that correct level. Because some patients, if you give them too much or too little oxygen, then they might become acidotic or something. And we definitely don't want that. <coughs> um, a lot of these patients have got NG tubes in. Hopefully the tube is securely taped. Still, you know, be careful. Don't haul on it. Um, we don't want to pull it out. G tubes, PEG tubes. Patients have got these things in their stomach. Again, it should be taped securely. Don't haul it out of there. Um, sometimes we're called upon to verify placement of tubes. Like they put an NG tube down somebody, they want us to come in and do an abdominal x-ray, check and see if that tube is in place. Um, you guys know how to do that. You shoot an abdomen x-ray, but cheat a little bit higher. Should be good. Um, but this is part of your patient care. Uh, catheters, good golly. Okay. I don't know how many times I've done this, and it always makes me feel so bad. The patient's got a catheter bag on. I don't see it because it's up under the blanket.